for careers beyond academia. And this is hosted by Facebook Reality Lab, who are merging experts across disciplines to create and build technology that helps you feel connected anytime, anywhere. So first off today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Dan Wetmore, who is a research scientist at Facebook Reality Lab. He'll be giving us a short talk with questions afterwards. So please type any into the questions box below your screen. Straight after that, we'll be hearing from a range of research scientists currently at Facebook, where they'll tell us a little bit about their journey from academia into industry. We also have live captioning for the event. To turn this on, please go to the bottom of your screen and click the button labeled CC, where you'll have the option to turn it on. So for now, I'll hand over to Dan, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Cleona. Uh, it is a pleasure um, to be here virtually from New York, from Brooklyn. Um, I, I first of all just wanted to say thank you um, to you and the other organizers for putting together, I mean, this whole community, first of all, but the conference specifically and, and this session with us, we're really excited about it. So thank you. Um, I, I'd like to start off before I dive into my talk and, and kind of the goal of, of my talk is to kind of tell you what we're doing as neuroscientists and um, computational biologists and a range of different um, experts that we have on our team um, in an industry setting that is based on foundational neuroscience and creating something that we think is grounded in really strong science, but also positioned to have impact at, at global scale. So that's a little different from my experiences, at least in the lab environment. So um, sharing that background, I hope will be really helpful. Um, and then as Cleona said, we'll pass it off to, um, you know, some of my colleagues who can share their paths from academic settings to, um, to Facebook Reality Labs. But before I dive into my talk, I'll, I'll quickly give my background to kind of uh, orient everyone. Uh, I finished my PhD in neuroscience um, in 2009 out at Stanford. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot and I had an, a ton of amazing colleagues, but, um, you know, it was something that wasn't positioned to have the type of impact that I was interested in. And so that led, to be honest, a, about a decades long range of experiences in early stage companies um, related to neuroscience. And that included a therapeutics company working on intellectual disability and Down syndrome, um, a number of uh, wearable neurotech companies, some apps and data science oriented work. And then that brought me to Control Labs um, in 2018 to work on neural interfaces, which I'll talk about today. And about a year ago, Control Labs was acquired by Facebook Reality Labs to develop our technology internally here. And so um, that's the express version of about 20 years working in, in research and neuroscience. And with that, um, I will share my screen. And Cleon, if you could give me a, a thumbs up when this one is working. Can you see me full screen or see the, the slides full screen? Excellent. Uh, so let me dive in um, to a little bit of the work that we're doing in the Control Labs group uh, at Facebook Reality Labs. Uh, I have my, I, I put my contact info up here and I, I do encourage anyone um, in the Black and Neuro community, if you have follow-up questions to reach out to me, um, I'm more than happy to help. So today, four main topics, um, kind of the Control Labs vision, how, um, the genesis of uh, an idea led to a lot of neuroscience, hardware and software engineering work that brought us to today. I'll talk about some of the foundational progress we made over those several years, um, show some like cutting edge latest demo videos and recent work from uh, you know, within the context of Facebook Reality Labs and finish with some kind of hot off the presses, recent highlights of work that is very much still in progress. So let's dive in. Control Labs was founded uh, out of Columbia Neuroscience in 2015, basically based on a pretty simple premise. The idea being that um, as humans interacting with technology, we tend to have extremely high bandwidth for input. There are screens and speakers that surround us and we have really quite remarkable capacity to manage high bandwidth inputs in that way. 
But historically, particularly in these last years where so much of our interaction with technology is here or even here, it's quite limiting. And those are like really prime context for understanding how our output can be quite limited. And so this led to a kind of uh, an idea of a, a different framework that was positioned to expand the bandwidth of human output. An idea was really framed in an understanding of the basis of how we interact with our environment through our motor system. So um, here you're looking at a, a snippet of um, electromyography signals, EMG signals that are driven by smi spinal motor neurons uh, under control, of course, of um, uh, um, brain circuits that drive descending motor pathways. Um, these activate your muscles and through your musculoskeletal system, they lead to movements and outputs that can be detected from different transducers, a microphone that can detect the output of your voice from the musculature there, as well as the keyboards and the touch screens that we're so used to today. Now, usually that is a, like a quite indirect way to interact with a computer. And the, the simple idea that was the foundation for Control Labs was let's go directly from the neural signals, the EMG signals, to machine control? Can that lead to higher bandwidth and more natural ways of interacting with technology? Now, of course, this is all within the context of, you know, the way that I'm, I'm sure this is a neuroscience audience. Many of you have seen a slide that either this slide or something like it, neuroscientists often think about the temporal and spatial scale of the signals that we're working with and the technologies that are amenable to, to resolution in this way. Now, one of the nice things about EMG, we tend to capture um, capture activity that you know is on the time scale of a motor unit action potential, you know, tens of milliseconds, um, really up to seconds and longer. And the spatial scale that we're looking at, well, what's interesting is if we're probing a single motor unit, we're in a position to really be at um, a, we're, we're looking at a, the activity driven by a single neuron. So our effective spatial scale in that sense can be quite fine. Although for the most part, we tend to think about how, um, how these, gener these signals are generated, in our case, in the 14 or in some cases, 15 muscles of the forearm. Now, of course, um, you know, our focus here is on the peripheral nervous system, and that is to distinguish neural interfaces that directly interact with signals in the brain or with um, uh, autonomic nervous system pathways. We're focused on the peripheral nervous system and particularly on the motor neuron and the motor unit, right? And this is kind of a reminder back to some intro neural classes for many of you perhaps, but um, recall that the motor neuron in, this, in the spinal cord through a long axon um, innervates many muscle units in a single muscle and together they comprise a motor unit. And that's really the, the foundational anatomical composition of all the signals that we work with. Now we're focused on non-invasive electrical recordings of muscle activity. And these have been relatively well characterized for many decades. Although to be honest, we're still learning new things um, either internally or together with our collaborators about how these signals propagate. So um, generally the, the innervation zone, right, is uh, subcutaneous and the muscle fibers act as an amplifier for the motor neuron signal. And this is what we can really take advantage of. These signals are relatively high amplitude. They propagate in known ways and they create fields that can be detected on the surface, either in a monopolar or uh, differential um, framework. Now, these are the waveforms that comprise the signals that we work with. Now, of course, contextually, when, we, when Control Labs was, was founded, that you know, the simple question is, where do you want to put an array of electrodes to record EMG? What would be most impactful? And there's a couple good reasons to work with muscles that control the hands, fingers, and wrist. First of all, um, we have incredible dexterity as humans of um, this part of our body. This is in part driven by the amount of cortical area uh, dedicated to control of this part of our body, but also to the anatomy of our forearm. And so if you look at one of these classic anatomical 
um, drawings here, you can see that even relatively simple movements of even just my wrist will activate more than one of these muscles and do so in a really fine spatial and temporal pattern. And so you can actually see here in my arm, one of our latest prototypes, this is a, a radial array that's detecting the activity of those muscles, in this case at the wrist. So that's the quick kind of framing background. Where did we get to over these last five years? So first of all, we recognized that we needed incredible hardware to be able to detect the signals, to do machine learning and build inference models that allow us to understand based just on EMG, what the hand is doing, right? What the muscles that control the hand are doing. And so what you see here is a rendering of an earlier device, but the signal quality on our current system is very similar. You can see here, oh, I don't know, some five minutes or so of EMG signals from one channel. And each, um, you recognize there's roughly three levels of little red dots that have been uh, decomposed to the constituent motor unit action potentials. And what this, if you overlay each of these snippets of the waveform, you recognize that these, there are likely three individual motor units being detected by this single channel. And this is really quite revolutionary. This has been known to be possible with wet, wet electrodes. There are some simple systems that have done so um, with other technologies. But for us to have a device that you can just put on that's wireless with dry electrodes required some really remarkable engineering from our hardware team to, put the, uh, to get the signal to noise down quite low and enable a nice mechanical low impedance connection to the skin. So uh, we have been building uh, this research program with support from fantastic scientific advisors, um, including uh, Liam Paninsky and Daniel Wolpert from Columbia, Krishna Shinoy from Stanford, Dario Farina from Imperial College, and John Krakauer from Johns Hopkins. Now, I, we internally look at this list and we say these are fantastic scientists. And we also recognize that uh, this is not a very um, there's no gender balance among these advisors, and there's many other axes where we can in increase the diversity of opinions that are, you know, supporting us scientifically. Um, and so uh, this is one area of improvement that we need to make, and, and we recognize and welcome ideas from the Black and Neuro community and introductions of advisors who would support our scientific mission. So the first thing that we did was develop models based on biomimetic control. And when we talk about biomimetic control, we're talking about um, movements of your hands that, that you're comfortable and used to doing, pinches or snaps or other, uh, a fist or an open hand, simple types of gestures. And the idea was based on these array of signals, these 16 channels of EMG and our knowledge of the underlying anatomy, can we build models of the hand? And this will be the first of several videos I'll show during this talk. This is one of our co-founders, Thomas Reardon, wearing an earlier version of our device. And he's running a model that's operating in real time, rendering a virtual hand that is doing, that is, you know, modeled, that is intending to model the actual things he's doing with his hand. Um, and you'll notice this is um, remarkably, um, we, we got to some remarkable levels of accuracy. And what's nice is it's independent of position. It doesn't require, it doesn't suffer from any of the issues that a computer vision system have like occlusion, it can work behind your back. Um, and it also registers not your actual movements, but your intent. And that aspect of intent being the signal that we're interested in is really nice because your intent is what manifests you know, through your, your uh, neuromotor system uh, in terms of how you might want to interact with machines. In this video, we're showing another advantage of EMG relative to, for example, a computer vision system, that we can detect the force with which you're making a particular gesture. And by detecting that force, we've given you a whole additional degree of freedom, right? You could change the volume according to the force of a particular gesture, for example. And so many of these biomimetic gesture-based 
models were the basis of our early work. And we've really advanced these quite substantially. Well, let's see if this will play. Pausing for me here. Uh oh. If it's choppy for me, I know it's choppy for you. Let's try this again. So here you're seeing one of my colleagues wearing the latest version of our hardware and running a, a set of models that detect pinches, squeezes, rolls of his wrist, different ways of flicking his fingers and does it irrespective of pose, can do it behind his back and does it with really minimal latency, which is, are some of the features you'd really like out of a system. More importantly, these are all very comfortable, subtle forms of movement. Something that you could do with your hand at your side, you know, in a future post COVID era, perhaps in a crowded subway. And so what you're seeing here is really based on many years of signal processing advancements internally for pre-processing the EMG signals across these various channels, as well as some incredible modeling work by the dozens of uh, scientists on our team, plus support from an incredible software hardware and interaction teams internally. The spirit of ultra low friction, simple ways of controlling technology is really manifest quite nicely in a recent model that our team put together. Um, one of the panelists, Vinay Jayaram, was one of the key scientists on this program. And what you see here is that a simple swipe of the thumb across the index finger is used to, to uh, navigate like a D-pad, left, right, up, down, and to select or deselect in this photo app. But this is, those are all relatively low bandwidth. And so we've also put, we are also pushing the boundary of how we can radically increase the capabilities of, of text entry, for example. So here you're looking at uh, a video uh, and of one of my colleagues wearing two bands, right? And what we've done is we've trained a highly personalized model based on QWERTY typing data that allows typing without an actual keyboard. So the typing itself is happening right on the table, but with a QWERTY arrangement, we can detect those and using a natural language model to uh, correct any mistakes, just like you might have in the Gmail interface, we're able to create a level of uh, text output that matches some of you know our fastest, our best models uh, begin to approach some of our fastest typers internally, which um, is a remarkable proof of concept and something that we're gonna continue to invest in and improve on over the next years. So what you saw so far is about where we were a year ago when we were acquired by Facebook Reality Labs. And so I wanna take this transition point to talk a little bit about this fantastic set of technologists, of engineers, of scientists, um, of creative minds who are developing the technologies of the future across a range of different domains, right? And all of these technology development efforts are integrated in the sense of our goal is to build technologies that support future virtual reality and augmented reality systems. Now, many of you may be familiar with uh, current virtual reality systems um, from, from Facebook, the Oculus headsets, including a new one that was recently released. But what, we've been very public about the investment in a range of these different technologies that allow future augmented reality. And this includes spatial audio, you know, a sound that you experience in a virtual world sounds like it's coming from the right or the left or something like that, um, as well as virtual presence, a range of incredible optics work to support these new systems um, and uh, quite a bit more. So uh, I think one of the key messages from, from the perspective of this community here is that even if you're not a neuroscientist, there are lots of ways that um, someone with deep scientific expertise or technical expertise can contribute it at uh, FRL at Facebook Reality Labs. So I'm gonna show this next video, next few videos where we're beginning to explore what is it like 
to use some of our models in a virtual environment. And here my colleague, Nathan, is running a hand, that virtual hand model that you saw earlier. And he's doing so in a virtual environment, right? He's squeezing the ball, applying a particular force and it changes its, um, it changes its color and its shape. You can pick it up and reach down. And I have to say, having experienced these myself, um, the, the increasing immersion and presence that you get from having a real, that the hand is really doing in virtual environment, what your hand is doing is, you know, quite fun, but also just increases that immersion, which leads to a better experience. Um, here, we were exploring how can you implement controls to, to control virtual objects at a distance? And here my colleague, Steven, is grabbing a virtual object with one pose and gesture, using different pinches and hand movements to spin the, the object along different axes. And then he's even trained up a simple like a simple gesture that throws a ball. And then there's that really satisfying snap that clears the whole environment. And so this has been one of these test benches, if you will, where we explore how do you apply um, how do you apply the results of our models in a virtual environment for control for bandwidth? How can you use force to change the rate in which an object is spinning, for example? Here's another recent example, kind of showing an idea for how what a simple, very low force set of gestures can be used to navigate and select in a virtual environment. What's nice about it, you're no longer constrained to being at your desk or being at your laptop, right? This is a, a wireless VR headset. Now my colleague Chris is able to use some simple pinches or squeezes in his fist of his pinky or his index finger to navigate as well as swipes of his uh, thumb or other fingers. And now that we're at Facebook, many of our videos end with a Facebook thumbs up, but a really nice demonstration from Chris about some of the ways that we're beginning to integrate our technology for these immersive environments. So next, I'd like to talk about some of the kind of core research um, and some recent advances and some of the ongoing research programs that are driving our continued development in this area. And I also think these, these concepts and topics are important because you can begin to understand what a group of two or three or 10 of our scientists internally are working on, right? What, what are the scientific questions that we're really digging into on a daily basis? So I'd like to start with um, some of our work related to the physiological interpretation of EMG signals. Now, this is a really important area because when we look at the, the real-time activity, and I showed you a few static snippets in some of our slides, of EMG across, for example, in this case, 16 channels, um, this, the signals um, can be actually quite complex, right? You're seeing the overlay of many motor units. They may, motor units may be present, signals from a single motor unit may be present on multiple channels, depending on the position of the motor unit and the, and the electrode channels. And so we have an, a number of teams who are working on ways to decompose those signals, those EMG signals, into the constituent either motor units or even understanding which muscle was the source of activity. Because to the extent that we can decompose our signals in that way, we're in a position to build models that are more aware of the functional neuroanatomy. So for example, to the extent that we decompose our signals into individual motor units, this is the quantum of motor control. This gives us the potential to build models that are aware of how single neurons in your nervous system are driving your motor output. Similarly, to the extent that we can decompose signals consistently to particular muscles, well, we know which muscles control uh, which movements, for example, and this allows us to begin to make models that are, build models that are more robust across humans, right? The diversity of humans who have, um, signals that differ due to the amount of hair on your arm, the size of your arm, and frankly, even environmental factors, right? Signals relate, you know, how you're wearing the device is one aspect of that. 
on a particular day, but also what's the relative humidity? Are you in a dry office environment? Again, some post COVID era uh, in, in the winter, or are you outside on a July day and sweating? So all of those will affect the signals and thus affect the models. And so we're investing in decomposing the EMG signals to uh, the, in these ways. So here, what you're looking at are a, a couple dozen motor units that we've decomposed from raw EMG signals. And they've been ordered from top to bottom according to um, particular patterns of activation during a few different type of gestures over these, um, I don't know, tens of seconds, maybe a minute or two. And what's helpful is when we do it in this way, you recognize that the, the motor units cluster and we can begin to make inferences about how the, the clustering of motor units in the context of a particular known muscle activation relates to the actual underlying muscle activity, both in terms of the identity of the muscle and the relative force that's activated. Another way we can begin to think about this is in a spatial framework. So we have these 16 channels, they're radially uh, array, they're arrayed radially around the wrist. Can we use knowledge about the consistent position of particular muscles or tendons um, to better understand the spatial location of these signals? So for example, we the, the first eight or nine motor units at the top left are present mostly on the first three electrodes. The next set of motor units are present on some neighboring electrodes and so forth. And in this way, this is another approach to begin to map spatially back to the muscles given their known locations. Another way we're approaching this and one of the rationales for doing so is to align signals across sessions. Mostly this is due to slight changes in orientation of the device from when you doff it and, and don it again, when you put it back on. And so um, some of our scientists are working on models that can computationally uh, calibrate and align these signals consistently across sessions. So here you can see on the left in red and green, signals in, from a spatial perspective are represented and intensity perspective are represented in green and red. And then uh, computational rotation aligns those, and you're seeing that overlap in yellow, which allows us to build much more robust models. Another approach we're taking is, to, is basically a, a, a model-free approach. In other words, an adaptive learning approach. And here in this video, let's see if we can get it to play. Yeah, so on the left, you're seeing the raw EMG signals from 16 channels and the inset video of some thumb movements. And this is a model that is learning essentially an arbitrary from the perspective of the model, but a specific set of movements or muscle outputs that this subject is making to move left, right, up and down. And the model gets progressively better over some tens of seconds at even this simple type of model. So these are interesting because they provide more flexibility to the user and also hopefully will account for users who are are differently abled, for example, who may have uh, a different set of muscles or a different hand anatomy or may have had an injury. Now, one of the really exciting areas that we're working on is how can we bring control down to that quantum of a single motor unit? And there's a couple key frameworks that have been known for a long time about single motor units. So one, canonical framework is motor recruitment. So this idea is that as force increases at a particular, across a particular joint due to activation of a particular muscle, that motor units are recruited in a stereotyped way. And what this means is that for a particular uh, recruitment threshold, um, the, the force of the motor unit is generally has been, you know, in many muscles sort of in the textbook that the recruitment threshold uh, correlates to the, the twitch force of that particular muscle fiber. And, you know, um, textbooks capture the zeitgeist at a particular moment in time across the community of scientists. And the textbook that perhaps many of us have learned from or read uh, for me, a little longer time ago, it was an earlier version than the 2012 version, 
but it had a similar uh, content here. The size principle has two important consequences for the control of movement by the nervous system. First, the sequence of motor neuron recruitment is determined by spinal mechanisms and not by higher regions of the nervous system. This means that the brain cannot selectively activate specific motor units. Well, turns out that this is not exactly true, and it's been known that it's possible to activate single motor units for decades. The problem is when you activate a single motor unit, it's imperceptible. In other words, I, I can't tell through somatosensory or proprioceptive um, feedback that I have activated a single motor unit, and thus without any feedback, I can't learn to do so. So um, back in the 60s, scientists began using auditory or visual feedback to allow subjects to control single motor units with a minimally invasive preparation. And this is an example of some of the motor units that they detected, and they were able to reliably activate them, in particular, being able to volitionally activate a single spike, a doublet, a triplet, and so forth. What this means, if you can activate a single motor unit, you're able to have a one-bit controller that is at the highest um, it's at the resolution of a single neuron. And here my colleague, Steven, has trained up a model to be activated by a single motor unit. And so he can make the dyno jump without any perceptible movements of, uh, of his arm or very, very minor movements. And that type of neuro control is something that is a, is a long-term research interest for our group. Another really exciting result that's that's um, come out of our team recently is independent control of motor units on a single recruitment curve. And here on the left, you see um, waveforms of two units uh, present, probably from the same muscle, we believe from the same muscle. Oops, I believe this is a video. And my colleague Alex trained himself over the course of about a week, it was a really substantial effort to selectively activate either the red unit or the blue unit. And the reason this was so significant is that on the first day of training, if you look in the upper left, he could not activate, he could activate the blue unit by itself because it was lower in the recruitment curve, but he could not activate the red unit without activating the blue unit, consistent with it being a little higher on the recruitment curve. What this meant is, if you looked at his performance at going left and right in that simple game I showed on the preceding slide, he failed all the time uh, for, for the, the red direction. And as a result, the spike rate in, in the space of spike rate for the, the red spike and the blue spike is only able to access part of that space. But over the course of days of training, you'll see that he, was con he became able to selectively activate these two units just to efficiently get to both the left, right, red, blue targets, and essentially opened up a previously unavailable portion of this spike rate phase space. This independent control is, an, is basically an increase in his bandwidth of control at the level of single motor units. And so this augmentation is something that's very interesting to us because if you look at the number of motor axons that innervate you know, specific muscles, it's generally on the order of hundreds and thousands. Now, this is a long-term research program and there's lots of unknowns. We're really at the edge of the science here, but to the extent that we can teach people to control individual motor units in a way that has low cognitive and physical load, then we have the capabilities to radically improve that output, which has been our goal from the beginning. So with that, um, I'd, I'd like to take questions in a moment, but first I just wanna make, um, this will be a pitch that I, will be repeated, I think in our professional development session, um, but we are actively recruiting. Uh, we have teams in New York City, in the Bay Area, in our control labs group. Um, we also have a representative today from the brain computer interface group at Facebook Reality Labs, Stefan Offel Thacker. Uh, they're based in the Bay Area. And, you know, we're recruiting um, neuroscientists, engineer, um, machine learning ex experts from computer science and, and other domains. And so I include a link here um, of the careers page. And I also coordinated with Cleona that we will send around afterwards contact information for our recruiters and a few specific um, positions that are currently posted 
Uh, one sort of time sensitive note is that we have, uh, we are currently interviewing uh, interns for 2021. These are 12 to 24 week positions, paid positions. Uh, ideally in our offices, although that of course is COVID dependent, uh, we've had some interns this year uh, during work from home. You know, it's disappointing to all of us that we can't be together in person and share ideas over a lunch or something, but I've been really impressed with um, the output of these interns. You know, these are substantive key contributors to our team. So um, please uh, check out the links that I'll send around. And my final note is um, if you do, if anyone in this community or folks that you know do apply to one of our positions, please send me an email. Uh, sometime, Facebook is a big company and applications sometimes, I don't even understand exactly how it all works, but sometimes they get, um, uh, they don't get routed in the right way. So I want to make sure um, that I get a heads up uh, from anyone who applies. So, so please do. Um, and with that, uh, I would love to take any questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dan, for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, to kickstart off the questions, I suppose, um, you did mention that you're recruiting from a range of different fields into the positions. I suppose a lot of people who are watching might be wondering how their research within science might be applicable within an industry role like such as Facebook. Um, are there any base kind of foundation skills that you might be looking for in applications? Yeah, so you know, our work is particularly, you know, we are uh, mostly a computational neuroscience group. And um, that means we have folks coming from, you know, uh, computational data intensive um, fields that have some biology background generally, although people who are just experts in deep learning and machine learning are certainly key contributors to our team. We have members of our team who have more expertise in physiology, in signal processing, in motor control and motor learning, you know, being able to teach subjects new skills, new ways of, of, of uh, you know, new patterns of motor activation is one of the key ways that we can create nice control schemes. We also recruit in HCI, human computer interface design, which is um, just a really important area, less, a little less neuroscience heavy. Um, now, uh, and of course, we, we have uh, engineering roles, hardware, software, um, research engineering support. Now, oh, my expectation is there are some members of the Black and Neuro community who are world experts in, I don't know, molecular biology or, you know, something that, you know, um, that is more of a wet bench activity that we're, that is just not the focus of our work. So um, I, I think kind of, my recommendation for folks like that is that, you know, we might not be the right group, but there are so many companies out there looking for skilled scientists in those types of roles. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we have another question. Are these positions offered towards undergraduate students as well? And if not, are there any related opportunities for undergraduates that you would know of? Yeah, so our internships are largely focused on um, individuals who are, you know, during a PhD or who will take some, some months off to come work with us. Um, we have historically had some undergrad interns, although there are some restrictions from us doing so uh, within Facebook. But to be honest, we are, um, you know, we want the best people. Right, and if an intern is a fantastic, I mean, if an undergrad is a fantastic candidate, I'd like to get to know them and um, maybe they're a great fit for us regardless of you know, how many years they've had in school. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd also like to generally add um, that you know, being able to engage with the black and neuro community is, is something that's really important to us. Um, for a number of reasons, part of which is we're, we're trying to build technology that's at, at global scale. And that means having individuals contributing who come from a range of different backgrounds. Um, 
And that's how we create technology that hopefully will be more inclusive and effective for everyone. And, you know, across the age spectrum is part of that, right? And I, I look at technology in a very different way from someone who's an undergrad. And so um, that, that access is also an interesting one that's important to us. Um, in terms of undergrad internship opportunities, um, I, I'm happy to tackle that offline or, you know, maybe kind of revisit that with the larger group um, uh, panel discussion. But I, I think it really depends on, uh, on the domain expertise of, of the person asking the question. And, you know, my general suggestion is if, if you're the best at, you know, I don't know, you know, gut brain axis neurobiology. Well, I can recommend a couple companies who work in that area and they're always looking for talented folks to contribute and internships from, from that domain would, would be a good fit. But um, it's really about finding that right niche. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you so much. So um, I think we'll hop over to the panelists. Oh, we've got one more. Okay, we'll answer this one quickly and then we'll move over to uh, the rest of the panel. Um, are there any machine learning models in development that can integrate with vehicle autonomy based software that Facebook Reality Labs is currently working on? I am not aware of programs that are working on integration with autonomous vehicles. Uh, there may be, I don't know. Um, we're certainly, the work that we're doing, um, we're working at, at more foundational basis of control. I, um, I, I know it's an area of, of great general interest, um, but not something that I'm aware that we're focused on right now. Brilliant, thank you. So um, yeah, we'll switch over to the other panelists that are with us here today. Um, I'm also going to drop a link into the chat. It's a Google document form as uh, later on uh, we'll be kind of uh, teaming up with Facebook Reality Labs for a mentorship program. So if that's something that you think you'd be interested in, then please fill out your details in that form there. Great, so I, if I could ask the rest of the panelists. Come on video. Great. Brilliant, hi, lovely to meet you all. Um, what I think we might do is, so we'll, we're gonna go around and kind of hear a bit from each of you about your path from academia into industry and hear a little bit about your background. Uh, so if we go around and we start with Natalie, if that's okay. Yes, hi, uh, can you hear me? You should. Perfect. Yeah. Hi, uh, very nice to meet you, Cleona, and thank you for inviting us here and all the Black in your community. Uh, my name is uh, Nathalie Giraud, and I'm, um, I'm binational. I'm from France and Greece. And so my academia path started in Greece, where I studied computer science. Uh, th those were my undergrad studies. Uh, and uh, in Greece, they last four years. So, and they are, the undergrad studies end up with a thesis, a small one. So right after that, I kind of immediately went to, from academia to uh, starting my own business, uh, which uh, was around uh, teaching computer science, but uh, teaching computer science to uh, children with learning problem with learning disabilities or uh, special abilities children and adults. And it was great and it lasted two years until the economy shut everything down. Uh, at which point I decided to continue my uh, academic career a little longer. So I did a master's in Greece and the master's was centered around the technologies and biotechnology in particular. I studied the uh, ECG rates, so cardiac rhythms and uh, sleep, uh, uh, sleep cycles. And then decided to continue learning a little bit more about neuroscience. So I went to France and finished another master's there. 
And that's when I started a PhD in BCI. I was immediately captivated by the field of uh, brain computer interfaces. And so, yeah, my career path is not exactly a uh, traditional neuroscientist path since I started from computer science, but I sp spent a decent amount of time studying uh, uh, neuroscience related applications. And during my PhD, I worked a lot with, uh, as I said, brain computer interfaces, trying to study how to make them generalizable to wide public and uh, to make them not just work for a single person. And towards the end of uh, my PhD, I was approached by a colleague from uh, Control Labs who introduced me to this uh, amazing company who was doing this groundbreaking research around EMG. And, uh, that's, yeah, that seemed really, really interesting to me and I interviewed and fortunately got the position and I've been working there ever since around those similar subjects as my PhD. So making uh, the technology ac accessible to a, a wide array of people. I'm also working a bit around feedback and yeah, this is me pretty much. Excellent, thank you so much. So just to reiterate, to anyone watching. If you have any questions for any of the panelists, please just drop them in the Q&A below. Great, uh, we'll go to Claire next. Hi, uh, thanks to all the organizers and thanks for having us. Um, so I guess unlike Natalie, my background is in molecular and cellular biology. Um, back in my day, they didn't have undergraduate programs in neuroscience, but um, so I uh, finished my undergraduate degree at the University of Rennes in Brittany, France. I'm American, but I, I went to school abroad. Um, and there I studied uh, molecular biology and cellular biology with a focus on genetics. Um, after that, I did my master's at the same university in ethology um, and uh, animal cellular biology. Um, and that sparked my interest in, in behavior. Um, and it made it motivated me to pursue neuroscience for grad school. I, at the time, I did an um, internship during my second year of master's at the Rockefeller uh, at Rockefeller University on the Upper East Side, um, where I focused on uh, female mouse re sexual receptivity, which is you know a far distance away from what I do now. Um, but after starting grad school at Columbia, I fell in love with motor control and realized that by looking at the output of, of, of the, our motor system, we can get that much closer to the, the underpinnings of that behavior than we could say when examining sensory behavior. Um, through that, uh, through my PhD at Columbia, I, I got to know some of the folks who now work at Control Labs, and I was very interested in working in brain-computer interfaces, and I thought that this was a way to do that that allowed uh, our technology to reach a, a wide swath of, of people since it would be non-invasive. Um, and so that's what got me very excited about control labs in particular. Oh, how did I, and right, that's pretty much how I got to control labs is through that interest in BCI technology. So. Brilliant, thank you. And Carlos? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Carlos. Um, I've been at Control Labs for about two years now, working on algorithmic development for our UMG technology. Um, I did my undergrad in applied math at Columbia and uh, really quickly got interested in kind of computational biophysics there um, and pursued a PhD in it at Stanford, uh, where I worked on the Folding at Home project. Um, and, and really there, I, I kind of started shifting gears and getting more interested in uh, representation learning for time series. Um, and when I was going on my uh, job search, um, I kind of got disillusioned with academic positions um, and started looking more into kind of like small burgeoning startups, uh, which is um, basically how I found Control Labs and was fortunate enough to, um, to get the job and, 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 and kind of have a, uh, a nice mapping from, from that you know, world of uh, biomolecular <laughs> dynamics um, into machine learning for, for high dimensional time series in, in neuroscience, um, which has been quite satisfying. Great, thank you. Vinny? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Vinay. I'm one, uh, um, yeah, and thanks to everyone, of course, for, for inviting us here. So I did my undergrad in neurobiology and computer science, uh, computer science minor at Harvard. Um, so I was more on the biological side to start. I took a year off after that, and then I went over to Germany, the University of Tübingen, 
to do my PhD in non-invasive brain computer interfaces. Uh, I was working actually very similar to Natalie, I think, on the on how well we could generalize these across days. And so I was definitely interested from maybe not the start, but like for a while now in, in how we can make sure these things are robust and usable for people across time and not just in single sessions. Uh, over the course of my PhD, I also managed to do an internship at a prosthetics company called Autobach uh, that, that lives in Germany. And, and I think that was uh, where I realized that I was particularly interested in this problem of EMG-based control and how we can actually make things that are not just kind of usable in the technical sense, but usable at broadly speaking and across, you know, and in, in naturalistic contexts, as we say. Uh, and so uh, when I was finishing up my PhD, I was looking around in academic positions and also thinking a little bit about industry. And one thing that concerned me about academic positions was just that it's very hard to get the type of expertise you need to solve these problems in an academic lab. Um, because if you want to make a BCI, you need someone, you need to simultaneously solve a hardware, a software, and an interactions problem. Because people need to have reliable hardware, the software needs to work all the time, and people need to understand what they're doing, and someone has to explain this to them reliably, which can take up a lot of time in these kinds of experiments in the lab. And so it was very hard to find that in the academic community, but I was excited because one of my collaborators was working at Control Labs, and so they invited me to come over. And I came and, and I saw everything and I thought it was really cool that we could kind of, you know, in the startup environment, get everyone together who was doing um, all of these things and try and really push for this goal together. And, and that was kind of what really brought me to, to Control Labs and what I was very excited to join it for. Great, thank you. And we'll go to Steph next. Good morning from California. Uh, I'm Stephanie Nothel Thacker. I'm a technical program manager on the brain computer interface team. We're based in Menlo Park. And uh, it's interesting to hear everyone's diversity of educational background. All of my degrees were in biomedical engineering. Um, my undergrad was in somatosensory brain computer interfaces. So figuring out how to restore sensation, which was very cool. Uh, I did that at Arizona State. My PhD was at Northwestern where I hopped across the sulcus uh, to motor cortex and focused on neural control of movement. Uh, I guess similar to Natalie and Vinay, I also focused on generalizable decoders. But for me, it was figuring out how to make an, a motor decoder generalizable across a range of dynamics. So can a single algorithm still make good predictions whether you're lifting a feather versus lifting a heavy book? Um, after that, I actually went to government and was a scientific advisor to DARPA. A super cool job. We got to launch four different neurotech programs while I was there. Our whole portfolio was about seven programs uh, that span sensory neuroprosthetics, spinal cord injury, uh, AI for neurotech, and then really high resolution, high bandwidth interfaces to Cortex. Uh, after that, I came to Control Labs. I've been here since February. Super cool job. Uh, we're focused on using brain signals to predict text. So kind of similar to how you might talk to Alexa or Siri now. The idea is to do this without having to vocalize and just, you know, think, call mom, play music, etc., cetera, and, and have that happen. That is incredible. Thank you. And last but not least, Annie. Hello. Um, similar to Steph, I have a background in biomedical engineering. And my master's is basically focused on uh, translational medicine. So most of my background is in medical devices. I worked on a project uh, where Mont um, Montsinai and Memory and Sloan Catering Cancer Center to build a lot of uh, devices for patients with head and neck cancer. Basically they have trismus to help them in terms of like cleaning their mouth. The other projects I worked on is prototyping an EKG device. Uh, it was basically like a competition was with a startup and we won the competition. That's how I got a call from Control Lab saying, hey, we are a startup, uh, we need help with this EMG device. And I've been with Control Labs for over three years. So I started in helping to prototype the first generation, which we call the King Band uh, of our EMG devices. And over the course of my career growing, I switched over from the hardware team to the science team. And I'm currently uh, a research program manager. Basically, my job involves 
providing the essential data that our scientific team needs in terms of building their models or training or just developing all this neural interface technologies, providing those essential data to them. Um, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. It's been so good to hear uh, each of your stories and to hear the range of backgrounds that you've all come from. And I suppose uh, a lot of people who are watching might be wondering again, how their research, uh, how they might be able to get into something within industry that, that combines it with tech um, and into an industry like uh, Facebook Reality Labs. Um, so what advice would you give any aspiring scientists um, and students who are wanting to make that transition um, who might already have like a little bit of experience or some people might just be thinking to make that change as of recent? Uh, so if anyone has an answer, just feel free to unmute. Um, maybe a good initial comment would be to, to look out for our internships. Like Dan mentioned, there are several that are available right now um, for the coming winter season. Uh, these are mostly for PhDs. There are some non-PhD tracks as well, but this could be a good opportunity to come on site or virtually for a few months, then go back, finish your degree and get that taste of industry um, before going full time. And maybe on a more technical note, um, I, during my PhD, did all of my data collection and analysis using MATLAB. Um, and then once I started becoming interested in neurotechnology, I, I started uh, learning how to use Python um, and switched over my analyses uh, to that. And most of the coding that we do on the science team uh, uses Python for uh, analysis. Um, so that could be, I mean, just a minor detail, but something that came up for me. So if everyone is just totally fluid in Python, then I'll, you know, I'll stop talking now. But for me, that was something I thought about. Uh, when I was um, doing, I'm still, still a master student in, in Greece, I, I kind of moonlighted as a social networks uh, quote unquote expert. And I remember that uh, one of the things that was striking me the most because it had real applications to real life things was when we were studying uh, social networks and uh, we, we studied the research uh, saying that most people find their jobs or even their dream jobs through not first or second degree um, uh, people in their surroundings, but it was usually somebody who they had like a, a third degree connection or a second degree connection, or more importantly, somebody that they didn't share a circle with. So it was not somebody from your very like close circle of people you knew that would get you a job. It would be somebody that you met, for example, once in a conference or that you met once in, in some, some environment that was relevant to you, but then you never spoke of again. And, you know, you could reach out to them later and actually uh, they or they would reach out to you that's and i'm saying that because that's literally how i got the job the, the colleague that recommended me was not somebody that i would talk to every day we remotely knew each other we were maybe second degree acquaintances that had met a couple of times in conferences but we knew each other's work and that's how they recommended me the point of this is to say network as much as you can. Find your preferred means of networking because not everybody is equally uh, social. I, I'm not for sure. So I'm more like, I like to, to, to email and text more than I like to talk, but that's fine. Find your preferred mean and, and, and network as much as you can. And just, just to get out there, put yourself in the radar of people. I think that's, that's a great way of, of, of you know, getting opportunities. Yes. Aside from uh, the technical aspects of being, you know, the neuroscientist, of course, we have a neuroscientist, we need more. Um, there is other aspects of project management. So if in a case that you're just looking into and you think you have a project management skills, we have lots of teams, we need someone, we need people to help those teams, different teams achieve their goals to so just help them, you know, there's a set time date, there's a goal, we need the project managers to help them reach that goal. If you feel like, okay, this is something you love, that's something you can also look into. 
I, I like that comment. Just to add on to it, uh, I guess there are some skills that you get in graduate school that may not be obviously translatable. Like all of my graduate research was in with animals. So I'm very good at training animals, but I'm probably never going to do that again. Um, but what I think I learned from that experience is like patience, uh, <laughs> various aspects of management. So I would say don't underestimate those softer skills in addition to the technical ones, uh, learning how to read a figure. You know, it doesn't matter if you were a bench scientist who pipetted, you may never pipette again, but if you can read a figure really well and understand what goes into a good figure, um, those are very valuable skill sets to bring into industry. I think Carlos and Binai, did you jump, want to jump in there? I think I've seen you on mute at one point. Oh, um, just on a separate note, I, I guess uh, one thing I find really valuable in graduate school is um, being involved in a lot of like open source software and science projects. Um, and, you know, in addition to being, you know, something that you can show on your resume, um, you know, even if you have the smallest amount of like, experience in coding, if you contribute um, or involve, are involved in these communities, it can be a great way to, to, to kind of increase your social network um, and, and, and really, you know, find new opportunities. Uh, yeah, Steph already touched on this, I think, but, but just to echo her words, on the roads to hyper-specialization that is a PhD, we gain a lot of other skills that are also quite useful. And it's important to remember that, like, you might not get your PhD project once you get out into industry, but you've still probably learned a lot of relevant things that you could apply to our problem. I mean, like I said earlier, there's a lot of different fields that intersect uh, in BCI. Yeah, thank you. Um, I suppose, kind of going on from that, um, I think nearly all of you went from kind of bachelor's, possibly done a master's, then into a PhD, and then kind of went straight into the industry role. Um, Dinai, I think I heard you mention something about looking at postdocs. Um, I just want to know whether any of you considered potentially staying within academia and um, what helped you make that choice to go into industry versus academia? Uh, I can start, I suppose. Yeah, I was looking at some postdocs. Actually, uh, I was looking at some in Imperial College for that matter, where Dario Farina is now. Um, and, and really the decision for me just came down to the support that the, the lab had, like I was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, it's just hard to find, you know, in, in, in a postdoc, you'd be either using someone else's setup that's incredibly bespoke or building your own, which would just take you a year, two years. And that's just a lot of time and effort. And you're not sure if it's going to really be used once you're gone. And so one thing that just like really made me think about industry was the fact that people were worried about your work being usable and kind of like collaboration was very exciting and important to me. And just seeing how closely everyone worked was another one of the, the big reasons that I made the decision to go for control labs over trying to find a postdoc. Uh, I can go. Um, first of all, I think even though, and I don't think neither of us did a postdoc in this panel, I, we have colleagues that came to us from a postdoc. So I just want to make that clear. It's not like you, you can go do a postdoc, maybe even two, and then switch to industry. There's no no problem with that at all. Uh, I guess that you just gather the, the people here that immediately switch to industry for one reason or another. Uh, and for, for me, it was... I, I, I cannot really motivate it more than just say academia wasn't for me and I cannot really explain it because it was just a personal thing. I, I didn't feel at home in academia. I was really much more enthusiastic about working in the industry. And the reason why I don't want to dig into many details is because it might be more psychological than actual truth. But to me, like it always felt like industry is more focused on actually getting things out there and academia being more focused on long-term research, which was not a huge motivator for me. But again, don't take my word for it because it might just be in my head. I just made the choice. It was pretty clear. Doesn't mean that it always has to be. Brilliant, that's some great advice there, thank you. Um, so I think it, it would be good to kind of expand on your experiences within industry and kind of the strengths and weaknesses uh, that you guys have found 
from from your time there. Okay, I, I can start because one of the weaknesses, it's not exactly a weakness, like it can be seen as a weakness or a strength. I don't see it as a strength too much because the industry with respect to academia is much faster paced. Uh, and it feels to me that I, sometimes it feels like, oh my God, I cannot be doing that for too long or, you know, and then, and, and then you take a pause and you're like, no, I actually like this. But it can feel like, uh, sometimes things are really, really happening fast, and, and you gotta keep up, and you gotta, you you have to be present. In academia, at least I don't know in Europe, because it might be different in America. But in Europe, in academia, things evolve more. Um, you know, you go into deep research, and you take your time, and you repeat, and it, it, it's not like somebody is around the corner expecting you to to get results. It's kind of like more self-paced in in a way. So that's yeah, that might be something that, that I could consider as a as a problem. Uh, and there are things that are problematic in both academia and industry. I think you could also, to play devil's advocate, consider that as a strength. And that's one of the things that drew me to industry as well. In academia, we're really asking these, these huge questions. Uh, at least in my lab, the question was, uh, my PhD lab was, how does the brain and spinal cord produce movement? And that's huge. And, and I couldn't expect to hope to even address, I mean, I addressed a small part of that, but um, it, it's almost a daunting task and something that did uh, attract me to industry is the idea that we could we could have sort of smaller questions, not less interesting, but better constrained questions that we're perhaps more confident that we could address within a few months rather than wait for, say, a few years. Um, and so so I kind of enjoyed that that quicker iteration on, on projects in terms of development. Uh, completion and getting conclusions out. Uh, kind of going on this general theme, I, I think one thing that I found to be a, a somewhat, maybe not double-edged sword, but certainly something that's taken some getting used to in industry is that you also change the way you motivate projects quite a lot, uh, partially just because of, of you know how fast everything goes, but partially also because even if you're at least, so when we we were, I was thinking as when I was in my PhD that I was in a somewhat applied lab because the goal was to make a specific thing useful for people. The issue was that it was applied in the context of like end of life care medical devices, which just you have a lot more kind of leeway there than you do in, in, in products for, for the general population. And, and so one thing that certainly has been, um, has been some work to get used to has been uh, being able to motivate projects from like being by defining them in accordance with very specific needs for a specific thing that we want, as opposed to this more general, we don't know this thing about our system. It wouldn't it be so nice to know that let's spend six months on it now, which is something that we could, I could do much more back when I was doing my PhD. I would say it, it depends on what you want. So in academia, it's very much about the scientific questions uh, publishing papers are the currency, right? Um, in industry, it's very much about uh, practicality, developing a consumer product that's going to work for everyone, and that that's actually a very big deal. Facebook is, you know, a, a global industry. We serve people all over the world. For us on the BCI team, we're trying to develop an optical head device that works for different heads. Shape, shapes and sizes. Uh, it's an optical device that uses light and focuses on light absorption. Well, different hair color, hair types, skin tones are going to absorb light differently. And so we, we have to think about this as we innovate. It's not just the science of what is the best wavelength for results. It's the science of what is the best wavelength for everybody. And so that kind of changes the question that you're answering. Great, thank you. So um, I suppose uh, one other question uh, that I think a lot, a lot of people will be wondering is, I think going, coming from academia and going into industry, um, both Facebook and any other large industries can be seen as quite controversial sometimes. Um, how do you navigate around that?
you need a few yeah. seconds to think about that. Well, one. <laughs> well, the question was that it, it, the, how do we navigate around having made the jump from academia to industry? So I think so. Some individuals will see like Facebook and other large corporations as quite like controversial companies. And sometimes it can be, it, they might feel that they're kind of tackling and arguing with themselves about whether they'd like to choose to join or, or, or to not. Um, what, like, what are your thoughts around this? Uh, was it ever a problem for any of you guys? Or, um, and, and how did you get around that? Yeah, okay, my, my mic is already open, so I can answer that. Yeah, of course, uh, it was a, uh, when, and we came from the, from a startup. So uh, going from a, a small startup that's kind of like a more dreamy to, to a big corporation like Facebook took a bit of digesting. And it was, to say the least, strange. Uh, and um, it took some getting used to. Uh, but then... I have to say that there's a lot of uh, uh, concern and talk around ethics, around uh, how the products that we create are going to be used. Uh, for example, Steph and Carlos are part of an ethics committee. And uh, there is, um, when you learn about these actions uh, taking place within the company, it definitely makes you see it from a different angle and saying, okay, at least I can have a say now. Uh, it, it's not something that's going to happen despite me or besides me or or something that I'm not even going to have a say in even though I work on a similar thing somewhere else so I I was able to kind of turn it turn around the feeling of uh, being swallowed by a big company into okay now I can actually change something within the company and it's not as far-fetched of a dream I mean in the end companies are composed of people and it's the people that make a difference and the more we are that that have good ethical questions and concern the better I uh, I really love it here. It's it's exciting to be part of a big company that's so visible because neurotech can be contentious. You know, we have to figure out what to do with this very sensitive neural data. Um, the company's been very good about incorporating responsible innovation into every stage of product development. We have responsible innovation principles that we follow. Uh, our team currently has an internship position that I'll plug. Uh, for a bioethicist to come sit on site uh, virtually with our team over the next few months and, and work with us to tackle these questions. Uh, so I do think that we could be seen as maybe a leader in the field of, of how to approach neuroethics. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we're going to have to wrap up there. But um, honestly, thank you. It's been so interesting to hear from each of you. Um, we'll definitely plug any of the um, internships or positions that you guys have out there. Uh, Dan, is there any closing statements that you'd like to make? Uh, I'd just like to say thank you, Cleona, and um, to all the other organizers. Um, you guys have gone from zero to community to conference in a very short amount of time, which is <clears throat> really impressive, particularly in these times where you can't get together in person. But um, I love that we can connect with so many people from around the world in this way. So, and also thank you to my colleagues for being up on a Sunday morning and joining us here. Yes, thank you so much.